Here we go. Yeah, I believe that I'm recording. Good. Good, good, good. Welcome, Sam. Thank you for having me on your podcast. So, Sam, I've followed your work for a while and it's uh, it's always fascinated me. And um, I wanted to just talk to you about a few things because I know you've got a wealth of work that uh, I'm working my way through. But uh, a couple of things that uh, really fascinate me and I think are very relevant to the world we're living in today. And one of yours is the idea that narcissism is what I think you called an organizing principle in society. And then I know you had some specific advice for the young generation of today. But but let me start by just asking you a little bit about your background, why this topic has become one that both fascinates you and you've become an expert in. Well, originally I've been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. It was okay. a few dec decades ago. Yes. And then I started to study the topic. I discovered to my dismay that there was very little to study. Mm. There were scattered writings by the likes of Freud and Kohut and Kernberg and one or two others. Yes. And there was a lot of nonsense um, that narcissists are demonic entities and the disciples of the devil. I'm kidding you not. So this was a literature, the extant literature. And I decided to delve in in order to understand myself, basically. Yes. I've learned whatever I could. And then I, I realized that if I, if I wish to convey my experience and the experience of people around me, the adverse experiences of people around me, may I add, <laughs> then mm. I needed to come up to conjure, conjure up a, a completely new language. Yes. And that's essentially what I did. And this is a language in use today. Everyone and his dog, self-styled experts online, scholars, <laughs> you name it. There's plenty. Yes, I noticed there's many experts. Yes, so-called experts. Mm. Yeah, uh, everyone is using today my language, basically, okay. the language that I came up with. I was also the first to describe narcissistic abuse at the end yes. of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s. And that's what I've been doing for the last uh, 30 years. I've been studying narcissists, well over 2,300 of them. Mm. And their family members, nearest and dearest, colleagues, friends, you know, church, you name it. Yeah. And I've amassed the database database which i think is the biggest in the world on the topic and mm. um, derived lessons from it comparing mm. it all the time consciously or unconsciously of course to my own experiences yes but not not two narcissists are alike so i'm very careful i'm, I'm really attem attempting to be as scientific as i can because my mm. background is actually in physics i have a phd in physics so i am a scientist i'm much more of a scientist than the overwhelming vast majority of psychologists who when they grow up, want to be scientists, <laughs> but don't know exactly how. And so there's a lot of rubbish and pseudoscience in, in psychology. And yes. there are precious few who are rigorous and try to apply the scientific method. And I, I want to believe vaingloriously that I want to. And you are a psychiatrist as well. Is that, is no, that right? I'm not so. a psychiatrist. I'm a professor of psychology, clinical right. psychology. I'm uh -huh. not a clinician. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, so we, it all stems from your own diagnosis, which is fascinating, and then a 30-year sort of period of really researching something that hadn't been properly researched before. Yes. Well, it has been mentioned, of course, has been described and so on and so forth. Mm. But it is prior literature, uh, <laughs> before Wagner literature, <laughs> prior literature was essentially a captive of, of psychoanalysis and so yeah. various psychoanalytic schools. Yeah. And so um, it was very narrow and in many respects, very biased, very problematic, very non-scientific, if you wish, very, very literary and very speculative and very, and very, very much based on introspection yes. and a dearth, two or three case studies. It was, it was a very poor picture, a very poor picture, um, methodologically speaking. Now the situation is a lot better. Not, not, not owing to me, and not because of me. Yeah. But now the situation is a lot better because narcissism is a buzzword. Yeah, yeah. And it there's is. a lot of money sloshing around. It's a cottage industry. Yeah. And so there are the self-styled experts on YouTube, which are inflicting massive damage on the profession. And there are professionals in various universities and so on and so forth who are studying the topic. So the situation 
now academically speaking is much better, but ironically, as far as the populace, as far as the population, the situation is much worse mm. because today they're getting misinformation yes. and, and nonsensical advice and the wrong characterization of the of narcissism. I mean, it's a mess. Online, it's a bloody mess. I mean, it's very <laughs> difficult. Very difficult to, yeah. to secure real, good, veritable uh, information online. Okay, so, so Sam, let's start then with, with putting it into sort of context then, y your definition, if you like, or description of what, what it is we're talking about. Pathological narcissism is a clinical entity. It's a mm -hmm. disorder. It is supposedly a personality disorder. I've been, I've been, I've been trying to recast it or re reframe it as a post-traumatic condition, because in the history of the vast majority of narcissists, there is trauma, childhood mm -hmm. trauma and abuse. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a huge variety of of uh, abusive and trauma traumatizing behaviors. So, for example, spoiling the child, pedestalizing the child, idolizing the child. Overprotecting the child, parentifying mm -hmm. the child, instrumentalizing the child. These are abusive behaviors. Mm -hmm. They're not recognized as such widely, but they are. Mm -hmm. Because they deny the child access to reality, access to peers, and the ability to form healthy, enduring boundaries. Yes. The parent doesn't allow the child to separate and become an individual, a process known as separation and individuation. So mm -hmm. the uh, abuse is multifarious. But in the history of narcissists, there's always one kind or another of abuse. And also what we call adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. Mm -hmm. So why not consider narcissism as a, as a form of post-traumatic reaction, a post-traumatic condition? Now, this is not a, a scholastic debate. We know how to treat trauma very effectively, very effectively. We have great trauma therapies, but we have no idea how to treat personality disorders. We are complete failures in this field. Mm. So if we were to rearrange the furniture in our minds and realize that narcissism and borderline, and you know, they're all post-traumatic conditions, then we would have applied trauma therapies to these people. And maybe finally, we would have obtained some outcomes, favorable outcome, which we consistently fail to do right now with a variety of other treatment modalities. Very interesting. And, and do you see that happening now, Sam? And is that something you've been able to apply to yourself as well? I think, narcissism, I mentioned that narcissism is a clinical entity. It has become, the, the very word has become debased and molested and now is misapplied to a variety of situations and people mm. when it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Also, narcissism has been put, introduced into a straitjacket in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's a straitjacket of a list of behaviors, which are essentially social behaviors or lack of social behaviors, antisocial behaviors. And then there's a list of traits. It's, it's list, it's, it's categorical. It's like a list-based approach to diagnosis, which is a huge problem. I think that the two basic dynamics in pathological narcissism are the inability to recognize other people as separate to you and external. Yes. Regarding everyone as an internal object, which is manipulable because it's internal. Mm. That's the first uh, problem. And the second problem is the fact that narcissism, pathological narcissism, is a reaction to abuse and trauma in ver very early childhood. And therefore, this abuse and trauma disrupt the formation of a self. Ironically, the narcissist is selfless. Doesn't have a self. Yes. Doesn't have what, what Freud used to call ego. There are no mechanisms within the narcissist that allow the narcissist to interact with reality, to um, differentiate reality from fantasy, mm -hmm. to regard other people as stand alone external objects which are separate to the narcissist to develop empathy to to engage in productive relationships which involve intimacy and true interest in the partner 
They're unable to do all of this because their development, the development of narcissism has been disrupted very early on and has never resumed in any meaningful way afterwards. So these are the, the two core issues in narcissism. All the rest are symptoms. It's like we keep discussing the symptoms. Narcissists are, ex narcissists are exploitative, they're envious, they are this, they're that. It's like discussing temperature rather than discussing the pneumonia bacterium, you know? Yeah. It's going back to the root cause, isn't it? To say where we did need they... to We need to go back to the root cause and we are, we are not doing this. Yeah. We are not discussing trauma in narcissism. We are not discussing problems with um, the perception of other people in narcissism. We are not discussing all this. We are confining ourselves to symptoms, behaviors, observations. It's all very phenomenological, very superficial. Yes. There's no real dive into the depth of narcissism. And narcissism mm -hmm. is an abyss, a mm -hmm. huge abyss. I think narcissism, and I'm not alone, I'm mm -hmm. preceded by giants like Otto Kernberg and others. I think that narcissism is possibly the second worst mental mental health affliction after schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's that bad, and so did Otto Kernberg and, and quite a few others. It's really bad. And so to say, well, narcissists are basically glorified a-holes or exaggerated jerks, and that's that's not correct. That's not true at all. This may be the facade, but it's not. It's not the the background. It's not the hinterland. So this makes a lot of sense, Sam. And, and are you alone in following this path and and looking at the root cause and finding? this link to trauma and, and being able to explore that or are other people joining you? There are other people, of course. Um, people like Judith Herman, who is trying to link trauma with borderline personality disorder mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But we are faced with a major problem in the, in the profession. And that is the fact that starting in the 1970s and 1980s, we have discarded everything that came before as non-scientific. So starting in the 1980s, there is a pretension to science. Psychology can never be a, a science in principle because its raw material is mutable and changeable. And so it can never be a science. It could be a form of literature, structured literature, insightful literature, of course, but never a science. And yet there is this pretension to science. Psychologists believe that if they use statistics, it, it makes them scientists. You know, and so we dumped, we just trashed everything that came before. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Freud, I'm talking about Jung, I'm talking about Kohut, and even Kernberg. And we just trashed these people. We have we have committed patricide, but at the same time, we the whole profession became ruthless, Ruth, ruthless and ruthless. Ruthless and rootless. <laughs> and so it's it's not going anywhere because yeah. it deals with apparitions. It deals with superficialities. It deals with observation because that's what science does. science does. Real science is about observations in laboratories, about mm -hmm. experiments, about mm -hmm. studies. We don't we don't deal with the essence of the sun. We observe the sun. We don't have a dialogue with with an atom. We observe the atom. And so they say, well, it's the same for people. We don't need to talk to them. We don't need to go deep. We don't need to understand. We just need to observe them. It's a kind of second generation behaviorism. Yes. Behaviorists, the original behaviorists have dealt with rats and mice. And now the modern behaviorists are dealing with people. And yes, it does, of course, provide the capacity to predict certain behaviors under certain circumstances. So it's pretty useful when it comes to advertising or politics or politics, or show business and entertainment. Making behavioral predictions is a money-maker proposition, a money-making proposition. So that's why the, all the emphasis is on that. Mm. I mean, you can't make money by realizing that the narcissist cannot tell the difference between reality and fantasy. What kind of money is it in, in there? This insight couldn't yield any kind of profit or, or income. Or, and, and frankly, brands grants in psychology they go to profitable propositions like a grant would gravitate or something that could be applied in, in advertising 
Yes, I get it. Everything, follow the money, everything, <laughs> everything yes, follows. It's a corrupting influence. It's yes, corrupting, yes. It also motivates many, many scholars and, and uh, academics, motivates them to jump the gun. Yes. And to come up with findings based on very luridly put together studies, yeah. non-representative samples, wrong, wrongly applied statistics, and outright fabrication. Consequently, 80% of experiments in psychology cannot be replicated. Yes. This is known as a replication crisis. We see this in so many sectors of society, though, don't we, where money talks and people follow the money with their studies. But um, I wonder then if we can talk about how you see um, narcissism as this, what do you call an organizing principle in society? Do you see it then reflected in or manifesting itself in families, in groups, in organizations, and then in the wider society through politics? Human history can be grossly divided in, into two parts. The first part has dealt with tangible, all kinds of tangible, commodities, land, I mean, tangible. Even money was tangible for a while. <laughs> yes. The coming second, back, <laughs> no, now we have cryptocurrency. Which yeah, I know. <laughs> utter, utter, you know. So, and the second period has, has dealt with symbol. And the manipulation of symbol. And then within this second period in human history, which is pretty recent, and within this period, started with the Enlightenment in Europe in the 17th century, uh, we've had phases. We've had phases. And the most recent phase is attention, the manipulation and commodification of attention, and yes. now the manipulation and commodification of reality itself. Yes. So now we are on the verge of uh, coming up with products that package reality, manipulate it, and provide you with alternative reality or augmented reality or everything but not actual reality. That's the metaverse, for example. Yeah. And to, to a very large extent, I would say social media. Social media, yes. I was going to say social media. I mean, how do we... So I'm, 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 I'm attempting desperately to to respond to your question because it's a deep question <laughs> and unfortunately i can't compress it uh, no. more than that yeah so in an economy whose main products are attention mm. or main tender legal tender is attention yes. in reality narcissists are uniquely positioned to benefit mm. because narcissism is the art of garnering attention yes. also known as narcissistic supply Yes, I see. And narcissists are experts at substituting fantasy for reality. Narcissism is a fantasy defense, mm. gun or I, fantasy defense writ large. Mm. Narcissists are experts in garnering attention in order to support their fantasy, which sounds like the job description of the future. <laughs> yes. In other words, narcissism is what we call a positive adaptation. Yes. In our emerging civilization, narcissists are uniquely positioned and uniquely skilled uh, to benefit. And so narcissism is on, on the rise, on the increase, on the ascendance, because more and more people discover that being a narcissist pays. You could even become president of the United States in some cases. So there's no incentive to modify it or regulate narcissistic behaviors to transform somehow narcissistic traits into pro-social traits. Yes. To, to treat narcissism, if you're diagnosed with it, why would you treat narcissism if you're working in the finance industry, for example? And it suits you, yes. So I see a couple of things you've said there, Sam. You know, one, it, it pr probably has its origins in trauma, and there are many different kinds of trauma that, a large number of people have probably experienced. And then that maybe creates the potential or the traits that can then go on to be uh, emphasized, if you like, if one sees an advantage in, is that, would that be right? The environment that we have created, the new economy, new society, new civilization in short, mm -hmm. 
has probably been created by narcissists yeah. and schizoids, which are close cousins to narcissists, yeah. and is conducive to narcissism. Narcissism pays. Mm -hmm. Narcissism pays. It's exactly like, uh, let's say, if you are in Nazi Germany, psychopathy pays. Mm -hmm. And if you are in prison, crime pays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Adapting to the environment is the number one dictum of, of human life. And ironically, mental health is defined as adapting positively to a changing environment. Yes. So in Nazi Germany, an altruistic, charitable person would be mentally ill. And in Auschwitz, a happy-go-lucky person would be mentally ill. And in today's world, anyone who is not a narcissist has a problem. And I can foresee a future where we'd be, we would be treating people in order to inculcate in them a modicum of narcissism. Gosh, Sam, that's a scary thought. <laughs> Actually, I'm not original in what I'm saying. In 2016, in July, new scientists came up with a cover story. Parents, teach your children to be narcissists. Right. Because it's a positive adaptation to a changing environment. Yes. And what are your thoughts about that? Yes, I agree. You do? I fully agree, yes. I even think that psychopathy is the next thing. I think we're transitioning to a world where narcissism coupled with psychopathy, a condition known as malignant narcissism yes. or psychopathic narcissism, would be the name of the game. These people would rise to the top. We already know that in corporate settings, for example, studies by Hare, Robert Hare and Babiak, we already know that in corporate settings, there's five times more psychopaths than in the general population. Yeah, yeah. That's 500% more. And we know that in certain professions, narcissists are massively overrepresented. They gravitate to this profession. And these are not minor profession or tangential or fringe professions. These are this is politics, judiciary, law enforcement, the media, the entertainment industry, and so on and so forth. The people who decide our lives. There's a massive overrepresentation of narcissists. Yeah. So these are the people who what we see succeed in a traditional sense, they rise to the top of an organization or um, they take control, they are dominant. Um, but what about the rest? I mean, you're saying, yes, those might be useful traits for people who want to survive and succeed. But what about those who are members of the family, members of the group, members of the organization, members of society who are subject to the narcissistic traits being played out? Um, and when I say that narcissism is an organizing principle, it's also a hermeneutic principle in other words a principle that makes sense of life mm. a principle that imbues life with meaning and direction and purpose when i say this it doesn't it means that we are entering a world where everyone would want to be a narcissist some people would succeed because they're predisposed to being narcissists genetically or by mm. upbringing or whatever and some people wouldn't make it and they would be failed not what we call collapse narcissists <laughs> yes. So they wouldn't make it, but everyone would be a narcissist to some degree. Everyone would adopt narcissistic behaviors and traits. Everyone would would uh, toe the line. Everyone would use the same texts, which self-identify as narcissists. There will be like texts which identify you as a narcissist. So this will be there. And within ten or fifteen years, narcissism would be the bon ton, and and everyone would try to conform. Mm. And we would use tenets of narcissism to organize the institutions of society. Yes. The various styles of communication and attachment. Yeah. Behaviors such as dating, sexual scripts, social, social scripts. Everything will reflect to this or that extent an involvement of narcissism or an in, the influence of narcissism. So today when we say narcissists, we think of a minority who are abusive, exploitative, disempathic, and really, really bad guys or girls. Mm. But 20 years hence, you wouldn't need to say narcissist because everyone would be a narcissist. And so people would exploit each other transactionally and it would be considered 
utterly ethical and acceptable behavior. People would, would not have empathy, would lack empathy. Empathy would be a relic of time, times by gun. And those with empathy would be considered naive or dumb or mentally ill. I know it sounds bizarre, but this is exactly the way religions develop. Yes. And in my view, narcissism is a secular religion. Each and every narcissist is a godlike figure, in his own eyes at least. <laughs> a godlike figure. And the narcissist worships his or her false self. And so it's a church. Narcissists are missionary. They try to convert you to their point of view. They, a narcissist would like you to tell him that he's a genius. So he wants you to convert to his point. He introduces you, inducts you into a shared fantasy. So this is a contagion. This is something that people don't appreciate. It's a contagion. It's a pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking, Sam. Uh, and I, I hear what you're saying, but it, I, I, I felt more than sad. I feel sort of very bereft that, you know, this is... This is a world that we are creating for ourselves. That um, that we lose this sense of empathy and the ability to be real and interact with our real selves. I mean, it's everything. It's against everything that I work for. So, uh, you know, I wonder whether what, what, is there is there an alternative to to this outcome? It's, it's natural for it's natural for people of any given generation. Yes. To mourn and grieve and bemoan the <laughs> you know the changes of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the people born into the age of narcissism would regard it as utterly normative and, yes. and normal. They wouldn't say anything wrong with it or anything strange with it. Or anything. There's a lot of things we regard as normal. I've been listening to a, 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 an ecological doctor who would say, you know, we regard the fact that one in three people will develop cancer as normal, but that's just because we look at it in the context of society today. If you look back 100 years, that would not be normal at all. Yes. That would be abnormal. We normalize. We tend to normalize by normal. habituation. Yes. We become habituated. Yeah. So, for example, the hookup culture. The hookup, hookup culture is an example because you, sex used to be associated in the minds of everyone, men included. At the time, sex used to be associated with emotions. Mm -hmm. I mean, men resorted to prostitutes, for example, for sex sex services, but within decent society, so to speak, sex was always associated with emotions. I mean, read Jane Austen. The most emotional characters in Jane Austen are actually the men. The women are pretty calculating. You know? <laughs> is, he a good, yes. is he a good catch? Is he a good catch? This, Gotta this get married more. before they're 18, Sam. <laughs> yeah. And the men are the emotional, you know, all over the place uh, characters. Yes, yes. And yet today we became habituated to sex, which is utterly devoid of emotions. And actually the younger generations regard emotions as faux pas. It's impolite to, to catch emotions. This is the phrase they are using. Catching emotions is, is highly uncivil and a, a, a breach and transgression of the code of, of social conduct. And this has happened in, in 40 years. Yes. So. So we're going down this path then, Sam, and, uh, you know, we see more and more narcissistic traits and behaviors in families, in organizations and in society, uh, fueled by social media, no doubt, and our online presence. Uh, it, it, is there another way? Is there an opportunity to step off this conveyor belt somewhere and create a, a different kind of society for those of us that want to be real in our families and in our organizations? Well, the good news is that there is this principle of pluralism. So if you don't like society today, you do have the option, the technological possibility to disengage and group with like-minded people in a silo, a thought silo. <laughs> yes. And engage in confirmation bias to your heart's content. Yes. So, but this would be the only strategy, withdrawal, avoidance. 
the only strategies available to people who detest narcissism and regard it as dystopian, the only strategies would be avoidant strategies, what we call life constriction. So, but yeah, there would be islands of people who you know, would rail against narcissism and, and so on and so forth. But that would be, these would be rare exceptions. The same way we look at the Amish, Amish today, yeah? they rail against technology. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, and in some ways, they're a healthier race than the rest of us <laughs> in terms of... Take into account that there are 2 billion people on social media. Yeah. And that social media is 100,000 million percent a narcissistic platform. Mm -hmm. They are narcissistic platforms, multiple. 100,000 million percent, because the stock in trade of social media is attention. And... Yes. It engages in envious competition. There is what we call relative position, um, competition, envy. It's immediately recognizable as some kind of um, narcissistic extension or extension of narcissism. And yet there are 2 billion people on social media. Um, and the number is growing. And social media are becoming more radicalized and more extreme in their narcissism. Compare, for example, Facebook to TikTok. Mm -hmm. well, as time passes, the platforms themselves become more and more and more narcissistic. And some platforms are utterly psychopathic. I won't mention names. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But we are faced with this, with this situation. And 2 billion people have opted so I've made a prediction 10 years ago that humanity will be divided in two parts. The part that accepts narcissism as an organizing principle. The part that is enamored with ambition and competition and doesn't see any advantage or benefit to empathy and, and is bottom line um, oriented. The part that is misanthropic and atomized. The part that values self-sufficiency and... Um, and so there'll be this, this part of the global population and there'll be another part, which is the exact opposite. And I think, I think this second part would gradually win off social media, would, would kind of reject social media and the metaverse and all these forthcoming, oncoming, the onslaught of oncoming technology. So there will be a non-technological Luddite, if you wish, yep. part of the population and a technology addicted part of the population with technologies propagating and disseminating and inculcating narcissism. That's the way I see it. So there will be an anti-technological revolution, an anti-technological tidal wave, reminiscent very much of the Hargreaves uh, weaving machine. <laughs> the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. There, will be, there will be a technological war. I'm, yes. I'm pretty convinced of it, a civil war regarding technology. I think so. I, I, I went to a conference 10 years ago where I was, the speaker was talking about revolutions and the revolutions we've gone through and the technology revolution. But beyond the technology revolution was maybe what you're describing, the consciousness revolution or the ability to come back to conscious choice, thoughtful, critical thinking. And that was actually maybe the next and superior stage to the technology. So there must be some people who... No, I, I disagree no? vehemently. No. I don't think there will be a global trend that will engulf and encompass everyone. Mm. I think the vast majority of humanity have made their choice, unequivocally made their choice, and they have, they have chosen narcissism. These are the selfie generations and so on, and so on the digital natives. They've made their choice and they're highly narcissistic and end of story, it's irreversible. It's wishful thinking to say that this is can ever be reversed. I mean, this is this is the end of a story. And there would be, I mean, there would be a minority, maybe a sizable minority, I don't know, but there would be a minority who would reject this and there would be a kind of conflict of some kind. But to say that we are transitioning to a higher consciousness, that is woke bullshit. I'm sorry to say. It's as much nonsense as a lot of the victimhood messaging that's coming out of woke movements. Out of? Woke movements, W-O-K-E. Woke, yeah. woke movements. Yes. And so 
Sam, your advice, I know I heard you giving a, a lecture to young students. I don't know what year, were they just about to leave university or just starting? I, I was 17 years old on average. Oh, really? So they were just well, about to I start. I traumatised them at age 17. <laughs> but uh, I know your advice was life sucks and you're on your own. And I mean, tell us a little bit about that message for young people, because it's a, it seems to me quite a harsh world that you're painting um, for some. And uh, and this message then that, you know, this is the world you're coming into. Um, I don't know whether you got any feedback from those students sometime later. Uh, and I've been optimistic. That was, I think, before the pandemic. Yeah, 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 it was. And that, mm -hmm. that was an optimistic lecture, actually. I don't right. think... I wouldn't use the word harsh, I would use the word realistic. Mm. This is the world we live in. And we're do doing a disservice to, the, to youth when we tell them otherwise. I think the greatest role of any educational institution and any lecturer and any educator and any, is reality testing. Yes. We need to equip and prepare people for reality, however abhorrent that reality may be. So I think... The young are exposed to four trends which are which drive them away from reality, encourage them to engage in counterfactual thinking and to become delusional, self-deceiving. Number one is risk aversion. We are we detest we, we are terrified of risk. We dedicate an inordinate amount of time to avoiding risks and mitigating risks and managing risks. And and, and and measuring risks, and I don't know what. <laughs> Incredible yeah. amount of them. This is extremely counterproductive because mm. risk is the engine of growth and development. Yes. Absolutely. Den overprotecting children, sheltering them, is a disservice. So this is the first trend. The second trend is victimhood. Victimhood has become the most predominant identity. That's not me. That's a sociologist, Campbell, who said that we have transitioned from the age of dignity to the age of victimhood. Mm -hmm. So now victimhood is everyone in his dog is a victim, and there's a problem because there's a shortage of abusers. Because everyone is a victim, they need to find an abuser. And sometimes yeah, yeah. you have to share an abuser with someone, which is very inconvenient. <laughs> everyone is a victim, and victimhood yes. became not only an identity movement, but victimhood imposes obligations on other people because it self-imputes rights. If you're a victim, you automatically have rights. And these rights impose obligations on other people. So now children, uh, kids are into this. They are victims as transgender people, as, I mean, you name it, they're victims. There is intersectionality, which is great, because if you're a black girl, then you're twice victimized. You know, I mean, it's wonderful. Yeah. And everyone is collecting victimhood badges and competes. There's competitive victimhood going on, competitive victimhood. So that's the second trend. And what victimhood does, it disables you. As a victim, you're always passive. When you lose your passivity, you're no longer a victim. And you're at risk of becoming an abuser. You need to stay passive. Otherwise, you lose. You lose your membership in the club. So it encourages passivity. The third trend is the savior um, rescuer trend. Mm -hmm. That it's learned helplessness. Uh, by freezing, because, you know, when you're faced with a threat or a risk, there's flight of fight or flight response so by choosing choosing flight or by choosing freeze because the third reaction is freeze by choosing flight or freeze um i'm handing my agency to an outside person or institution or who would act as my saviors or my rescuers or my fixers or my healers when i go to therapy you know people come to therapy especially young people. I work a lot with young people. They come mm -hmm. to therapy and they sit back and they wait. You're supposed to fix them the way a mechanic 
would fix a car in a garage. You know? So they're there. They, they've made an effort. Isn't, shouldn't this be enough? They made an effort to attend the, the session. Shouldn't this be enough? Doesn't this entitle them to being to being fixed or being healed? And so on. So this learned helplessness is a, is a third trend. And the last trend, I mean, there are many others, but the four that worry me the most, the last one is what is entitlement. The yeah. sense that just by virtue of existing, without any commensurate hard work or hard study or investment or commitment or just by virtue of existing, you're automatically entitled. The very concept of human rights is a form of entitlement because you gain these rights by virtue of being human, which I think is very bad psychologically. Similarly, civil rights, we take them for granted because we are the passive recipients of these rights. We are entitled to them. We are entitled to democracy. We don't have to fight for it. We're entitled to it. We're entitled to be respected. Why should I respect you? What gives you the right to be respected? So, yeah. so risk taking, victimhood, savior, rescuer, complex, savior, rescuer, and entitlement. entitlement. And so that all comes back, uh, at, as you said, Sam, to you know reality, coming back to reality, and yet. Part of the definition of I understand it right of a nurse is somebody who doesn't live in reality. So how do you persuade someone of a generation which is tending towards narcissistic traits to accept the advice you're giving here, which is get real, live in the real world, don't live in this make-believe world? Well, not everyone can become a successful narcissist. <laughs> Narcissism is a choice of fantasy over reality. That much is true. Mm. But you do need certain minimum, <laughs> minimum, there are minimum requirements. And only a tiny sliver of the population meet these requirements. After all, there's something like 1% to 3% of the population who are narcissists. Forget what self-styled experts, the nonsense they spew online. Only 1% to 3% are narcissists. Mm -hmm. So not everyone can become a narcissist. And then if you can't succeed in fantasy, what's your other option? There are only two options, fantasy or reality. Yes. And because the odds the odds are stacked against you, statistically, you're going to you're going to be a collapsed narcissist. You're not going to succeed. You're not going to make it as a narcissist. It's like entrepreneurship, you know? Yeah, entrepreneurship is great. But how many successful entrepreneurs are there? You know, so we need to prepare the youth for reality. Now, there'll be one to three percent of them who would create fantastic worlds. They would create social media. They would create the world of finance. They would create, these are worlds of fantasy because these are worlds where we manipulate symbols and, and so on. So, yeah, there will be one to three percent who will end up owning Facebook or, you know, and these will be these will this one to three percent they will be naturally selected in a darwinian process but we can't prepare children for a life that does not correspond or is not commensurate with their skills talents and predispositions we need to prepare them for reality it is much more likely they will find themselves they will end up uh, in reality than in any other option. I, I feel happier about what you're telling me now, Sam, because, you know, if it's one to three percent are truly in that narcissistic spectrum uh, and the rest have got to accept reality, that sounds a better not really. equation to me. No, not really, because the reality they will have to accommodate themselves to would be rea a reality created by the narcissist. It would be a narcissistic psychopathic reality. So the elites are becoming more and more narcissistic. These are studies. These are not just you know a rant. Oh, yeah, <laughs> These yeah. are studies. The elite are becoming more and more narcissistic and increasingly more and more psychopathic. The yes. world is being shaped now by narcissists and psychopaths almost exclusively. Mm. 
So even in traditional societies, even in collectivist societies, narcissism is an organizing principle. So your grandiosity in a collectivist society would be belonging to a certain company or group or club. While in America, your grandiosity would consist of an individual accomplishment, but it's there. So the whole world is becoming narcissistic psychopath. So these people who cannot make it, these people who cannot become narcissists and psychopaths, they will be second-class citizens. They will be enslaved. We're entering a civilization of a crust of one to three percent who would rule as elites, but not even pretend. Today we have the pretension of democracy or the pretension of liberal liberalism or the pretension of human rights. Narcissism and psychopaths don't bother with this nonsense. Yeah. Uh, that's, and why, I... that's why, allow me just to say yeah. that this is why authoritarianism and autocracy are on the rise. Yes. That's exactly why. Because these people, the Putins, the Erdogans, the Netanyahu's, the Viktor Orbans, the Donald Trumps, they don't bother with niceties. They don't. What you see is what you get in this case. That's it. They're narcissists. They shape society to reflect their own predilections and proclivities and fears and phobias and paranoia and what have you. And you have to live. This is your ambience. You have to live there. That's your ecosystem. So it's not, okay. a, not an optimistic person. It's not a new phenomenon, though, Sam. I think what you're describing with a, a layer of elites who are narcissistic by trait or personality and everybody else existing underneath, it, it's become more apparent now and it becomes more manageable with no. technology and technology. It's not about structure. Of course, there's always there's always there have always been lobsters to borrow from Jordan Peterson. Yes. It's not about structure. Of course, there's always been a hierarchy. It's not mm. about hierarchy. It's about values. It's about values, or more precisely, the lack of values. This is a new elite. Of course, there's always an elite in the hoi polloi, or the proletariat, or the prawns. Yeah, there's always this division of labor. But the elite that is coming, the elite that is forming as we speak, would be dramatically different to any previous elite because it would be narcissistic and psychopathic. Mm. And narcissists and definitely psychopaths lack so many elements of humanity or being human, so many elements of humaneness, of being human, that there is could be a, a good philosophical argument that they're not. Not in the superstitious, idiotic sense that they are demons or, I mean, forget, uh, that's not my, my style, you may have noticed. But I mean, if you lack empathy, if you're unable to conceive of other people as external to you, if you regard them as internal objects that you can manipulate, if you have no access to emotions, tell me in which sense are you human? In which sense are you human? I've just taken away the three critical critical elements in defining who is human and who is not. You may be an android, you may be a robot, you may be a great simulation of a human, but in which sense are you human? I don't think they are. Well, there's humanity and there's humility, and I don't see either of those in the characters you describe. Narcissists and psychopaths lack the most basic prerequisites to qualify as members of the human species. Mm -hmm. Psychologically speaking, mm -hmm. organically, biologically, they're human. But psychologically, they're not. Not so, as we define a human. No. Sam, what have you learned from coming to terms with your own diagnosis and understanding how to manage your own traits? No, I, I, prefer, I prefer to keep my private life off limits. Okay. I'm here in my capacity as expert, expert on well, this. I was just interested to know whether that has informed some of your thinking. I, I prefer to keep my private life off limits. Thank you. Fine. Okay. Um, and so what advice do you have then for listeners coming to terms with the world as it unfolds um, who don't particularly necessarily want to be come or develop their narcissistic traits? Expect nothing. 
Isolate yourself to the best of your ability. Become totally self-sufficient. As far as you can, of course. There's always dependency. There's always networks of dependency. And unfortunately, you cannot evade them or escape them. But orient your life to become more and more self-sufficient. Make it a life goal to become more and more self-sufficient. For example, by becoming maybe self-employed. One example. Uh -huh. so. uh -huh. um, expect nothing. You'll never be disappointed. <laughs> Minimize vulnerabilities, exposure, and sharing. These are dangerous. Mm -hmm. and becoming more dangerous by the day. Mm-hmm. Um, leverage opportunities, situations, and institutions in your favor and try to the best of your ability to limit your empathy where you can make the most difference without incurring any costs which are excessive, which is not an easy proposition mm. in, in today's world. No. Um, there is no refuge. People deceive themselves and they say, well, this is the situation in North America or in the United Kingdom, in the West. So if I move away from the West, I go to Asia or I go to Africa. These people have never been to Asia and Africa. I have. I've lived in these continents. No difference whatsoever. How narcissism manifests, the way it is expressed is different, but it's there, <laughs> absolutely there. And it's on the ascendance, exactly like in the, the West. It's a global phenomenon. There's no refuge, no sanctuary, and no escape. So make your life into a lifeboat and a sanctuary and a refuge. And prepare for the worst. Because it's definitely coming. And these are not the ramblings of a messianic nutcase. This, unfor this is unfortunately, I think... Uh, a well-considered, quite cool-headed observation of, of things the way they're going. So make your life into a life raft or a lifeboat and yeah. um, prepare for the worst. Yeah. It's a Robinson Crusoe mentality, yes. I would say. I, yeah. If you need a role model, then I think Robinson Crusoe would, would be it. Because... He didn't give up on being productive or being creative, or he didn't give up on life. Robinson Crusoe embraced life, uh, even more so after he found himself in the status of an out uh, uh, castaway. He embraced, embraced life, and yet he was very vigilant. He was self-sufficient. He was not naive, not gullible. He did not develop any ex any expectations. He didn't have any expectations. He was positively surprised when the ship, you know, was on the horizon. He didn't expect <laughs> it. I think it's a perfect model for today's world. We yes. are all islands. We're yes. all islands. And there's an enormous perfect storm, which is already happening. Mm -hmm. A twister of incredible proportions. Yes. A period of transition, of course. A hundred years from now, we look back and we'll see this is a period of transition. I'm not kidding myself that this is unprecedented in human history. But regrettably, the people who are going to take charge are severely compromised, severely deficient. They've always been dictators, bloodthirsty and bloodlusting, you know, people. And there's always been narcissists. And there's always been, you know, th there's nothing new in this. But there's never been um, an elite that is essentially deprived of any ability to relate to other people, mm. any empathy, any access to emotions, in short, any common ground with others. There's no common denominator, no common language, no common ground, no possibility to efficaciously communicate with these people, with narcissists and psychopaths. Yeah. The communication is on the surface. Now, narcissism and, and uh, psychopathy and the prescription for the young that I mentioned, it's about self-efficacy. In other words, the ability to obtain favorable outcomes when you act in the environment and on the environment. And it's about agency. And it's about personal autonomy. 
and it's about independence. They're all very laudable things, commendable things. They, it so happens that these are also the only protections against narcissists and psychopaths. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you can't exercise these faculties within society. Shortly, you won't be able to. Because there'll be no society. There will be, society is a very new concept, by the way. If you go back to the 12th century, there's no concept of society. Society is very new, a new concept, new idea. Whose time has come? I mean, whose demise has come? We're going to revert to much early, to a much earlier period. A feudal, a feudal period, in effect. We already see this in income inequality. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go back. We are we are going back in time. We're time traveling to a feudal period, new neo feudal period, which is totally atomized because people in in people up until the 16th or 17th century, they didn't belong to countries. They belonged to their village. Yes. They defined themselves via their local patriotism. They belong to a village, or and so on. we're going. to it's going to happen again. We're going to be totally atomized. And we're going to go back to our tribes, our smaller groups. Our... Even smaller, yeah. I think locations, maybe a single building, maybe something like that. And even that is optimistic. Mm -hmm. I think the vast majority of people would, would end up in a room with very uh, being very close to self-sufficient in every way, shape, or form, working from the room, living in the room, Entertaining themselves in the room or the apartment, if they're lucky, because housing prices are, are what they are. So, and I think that'll be it. And I think that will be the new organization of, of human human groups or collectives. I wouldn't say societies anymore, because there'll be no communal interactions. Communal, communal interactions will become more and more dangerous. Yeah. The world is becoming dangerous. I agree with you on on much of that, Sam. I don't want to find that there's only a bleak outcome, but um, I think your advice to be Robin Hood is uh, Robinson Rob Crusoe, actually. Robinson Crusoe, but Robin Hood, yes, yeah, Robin Hood versus Robinson Crusoe, isn't it really? <laughs> well, Robin Hood was a bit of an outlaw, but yeah. <laughs> oh, Sam, thank you very much. Have you got one final word that you would like to share? I think we the only thing we didn't cover, uh, and by the way, it's not bleak. You keep saying bleak and dystopian and horrible. I, I can see on your face that you're a bit yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. discombobulated. It's bleak to you and me. Yes. People in the future would not consider it as bleak at all. They would consider it as normal. They would be joyful. They'll be happy. <laughs> Even today, 42% of adults in industrialized societies choose to remain lifelong single. The rate of marriage has gone down by, by 49%. Many, many women and men decide to remain childless. And they're extremely happy with their decisions. Yes. Many yeah. studies show that childless people are much happier than parents. So it's not that the, the future looks bleak to you because it's unfamiliar. But habituation and familiarity they would breed joy, not content, but joy. <laughs> I don't think we should be that, that pessimistic. The new we normal, don't... that's all. One thing I think we didn't cover is gender. Yes. And there is a war. Yeah. There are two, two trends. There's a war between genders, and there is the emergence of a unigender. Mm. And so this, to, to add to your bleak outlook, already I think there's a, a, a disconnect between men and women. And I'm now putting aside uh, homosexuals and you know, other sexual orientation, talk about heterosexual. Already there's a, a serious schism and, and break between men and women. It has numerous reasons. I'll not go in, into them right now. I have a whole contemporary sexuality playlist on my YouTube channel. But I think it's a threat much bigger, much larger than climate change. Mm -hmm. Climate change is a huge, huge threat. But we're going to adapt. We're going to move inland. We're going to find a way. We'll survive. 
will survive climate change because we have already. Humanity emerged during the ice age and then the world became 20 degrees hotter. Absolutely. And we're happy. Look yep. at us, your, your son yep. then. So I think we will survive climate change. I am not as sure that we will survive the estrangement between men and women. Mm. Not, not as convinced. The break, the schism, the, the, the divide between men and women is really beginning to worry me considerably. That is, that is something I, would, I agree with you, is bleak. That is bleak. There's no redeeming feature in this. None, not one. And yet it's growing all the time. If you follow Pew Center, they monitor the population of the United States. You follow their studies in the past 20 years. It's shocking. The numbers are shocking. What's happening is shocking. If you talk to young people about dating, about yeah. sex, about yeah. it's shocking. Even the frequency of sex, of course, is declined by 40, 40, 40 odd percent among, among uh, young people. The number of sexual partners, but also the frequency of sex, uh, they are disengaging. They are divorcing each other. They are avoiding each other. They're terrified of each other. They, they're anxious when they're well, together. Not happy. Indeed, the population is going right down in most countries. Population isn't it? is going down. I know there's this myth that the planet is overpopulated. Of course, it's not. Yeah. We are we are three hundred million children short yes. because we have pension systems, and these pension systems will collapse. They're not there are no young people to support them with their work. Yes. We need three hundred million people new people to support only the pension system mm -hmm. and we need another around 200 million people to support consumption at its current level without growth so half, half a billion people are missing <laughs> it's completely wrong to say that we are overpopulated we yeah. are overpopulated with all by old people i mean there's like one quarter of a population in industrialized countries is old yeah we have a surfeit a surplus of old people but not of young people. And here again, we come to the issue of gender. It's very difficult to procreate if you decide to remain a lifelong celibate. Or, or, and in Japan, lifelong celibates are the majority among people under age 35. By the way, the same trend is happening in the United Kingdom. That is bleak. That That's, is bleak. Yeah. Yes. And, and sad in many ways when one understands the benefits of connecting and the charm yes the charm is gone i mean the enchantment is gone yes that uh, that i agree know, that i, I agree. come to this as a as a, a as a, a mother and a grandmother you know i see the benefits of procreating and creating children and family i i feel sad that others will not experience that joy it's not only children but even intimacy even, you know, there's many other joys except children in, in togetherness and companionship and support mm -hmm. and sharing a common history, and memories, experiences. I mean, it's so much to recommend this. Um, and yet the men and women increasingly regard each other as enemies on, in all age groups, by the way, but especially pronounced among the young. And it, this I regard as a serious threat to the existence of the species, much more than climate change. Much more. That's why I wanted to mention it. That is bleak. And that's the only bleak thing that we've discussed, <laughs> believe it or not. Yes. In my view, at least. Good. Okay. Well, we'll forget Robin Hood. We'll finish on Robinson Crusoe and uh, and finding our own lifeboat, which I like the sense of, um, Sam. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really, really interesting. And I'm sure there's a much wider conversation we could have given more time. Thank you for having me in your podcast. Take care. Thanks, Sam. I hope that recorded all right at your end. And try to put an end to it. I'm not quite sure how. <laughs> You can take out the bit about Robin Hood and also you, you may take out the bit, I'll take it out, where I ask you about your 